Hello, everyone. Welcome to the World Congress of Anesthesiologists 2026 webinar series. Please, next. I am Daniela Filipescu. I am a cardiac anesthesiologist in Romania and president of the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists. And I have the honor to co-chair the World Congress of Anesthesiologists 2026, together with the president of the Moroccan Society of Anesthesia, Analgesia and Critical Care, Dr. Jamal Edine Cohen. Please, next. I have a great pleasure to introduce to you the World Congress of Anesthesiologists 2026. The World Congress of Anesthesiologists is the biennial congress of the WFSA, which is a federation of 141 member societies, which unites professionals across continents. The congress will provide an inclusive global platform for dialogue to inspire professional growth, knowledge, and connections. This is the next. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you the 19th World Congress of Anesthesiologists, which will be held in Marrakesh in Morocco between 15 and 19 of April in 2026. This Congress is um, um, organized in collaboration with our member society, the Moroccan society, SMAR, Société Marocaine d'Anesthésie, d'Analgésie et de Réanimation. The structure of the scientific program includes 19 specialty tracks, and you'll have the opportunity to uh, hear uh, 300 expert speakers representing all regions of the world in this Congress, and also to attend more than 400 lectures, workshops, problem-based learning discussions, see, to see the simulation space, the world anesthesia games, and posters. Next one, please. So I invite you to be part of the World Congress of Anesthesiologists uh, in 2026 uh, journey and to share your research and present your research in, in this Congress. Please note that the abstract submission will be open in June 2025 for four months until 30 of September. The registration will be open in January 2025 and uh, for our young colleagues, they can apply for scholarships in June 2025. The next, please. This um, uh, World Congress of Anesthesiologists webinar series aimed to introduce uh, uh, the scientific uh, program and some topics which will be presented during the Congress in uh, Marrakesh. We'll uh, organize uh, webinars every month dedicated to one track and uh, the next topics for October, November, December will be on obstetrics, airways, and regional anesthesia. They will be uh, free uh, on demand and available after the event. So for this one, uh, it will be available on Friday. Please, the next one. This uh, today uh, webinar is on main clinical events in anesthesia and uh, critical care. And I have the great honor to introduce our expert speakers, Professor Samir Jaber and uh, Professor Eli Azoulay. The next one, please. Professor Samir Jaber is uh, head of the critical care and anesthesia department in uh, saint eloi University Hospital in Montpellier, France. He is the editor-in-chief of the Intensive Care Medical Journal and also co-chair of the Scientific Committee of the World Congress of Anesthesiologists 2026. Professor Elia Zuley is Professor of Medicine, Specialty Pulmonary Medicine and Critical Care, Director of the Medical ICU of the Saint Louis Teaching Hospital in Paris, in France. He is the President of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine and also Co-Chair of the Critical Care Track of the World Congress of Anesthesiologists Scientific Program. Now, before I um, give the floor, to our uh, speakers, I have to make to make a few a couple of uh, uh, announcements, the housekeeping. So please uh, note that the captions in different languages. 
uh, can be activated uh, by uh, clicking on the button uh, at the bottom of the screen. And also, please use the Q&A um, uh, box for uh, questions at the end of the uh, meeting. We'll have uh, this uh, session on uh, quest question and answers at the uh, end of the two presentations. And now I have the pleasure to give the floor to our first speaker, Professor Samuel Jamet. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to, to, to thank you, uh, Daniela, uh, Mrs. President. Uh, it was a real pleasure to be uh, here in the first series. And I want also to thank all the members of the Scientific and Organization Committee of uh, the WFSA and the WCA Congress in uh, Morocco and Marrakesh in uh, 2026. I uh, always uh, it, it's a nice place marrakesh and i recommend you to go so uh, i will share my uh, screen and i will uh, present you now uh, my uh, talk uh, will focus uh, on the recent advances in anesthesia and the perioperative medicine and i will uh, propose you the next uh, plan this is my conflict of interest and the, the plan I will decided to focus on five major improvements and transfers in the last decades from anesthesia care from OR to intensive care and vice versa. So I will uh, present you some recent data in, in pre-oxygenation on airway management, on protective ventilation, local regional fuels and allogenic gas sedation during the next 20, 20 minutes, 25 minutes that I have. First of all, this uh, study uh, that we published uh, recently in the BGA is one of uh, study which evaluated uh, the difficult intubation in patients, both in operating room and in ICU, and also non-obese patient and obese patient. This study, uh, it's very interesting because you show here in the y-axis uh, the percentage of complication, and in the x-axis, here you have obese and non-obese patient in ICU, and here you have patient with obesity and patient without obesity in OR. And you have the rate of uh, uh, complication and the independent risk factor. As you see, when you are non-obese patient and you have been intubated and you have no difficult intubation, the complication is less one or 2%. So at the maximum, at the other end, when you are in you are patient with obesity and you are intubated in ICU, you have a complication above 50 to 60 percent. This is impressive that we should absolutely improve our practices in ICU by probably take what is good in OR and uh, transfer to ICU and reciprocate. The uh, independent risk factor in this study associated to the complication on intubation. Complications are mainly hypoxemia, uh, defined by oxygen saturation lower than 85 or 10, 90%, and hypotension or death or cardiac arrest. Then we find that difficult intubation, patient with obesity and to be intubated in ICU are difficult, uh, are independent risks to have complication. <coughs> <coughs> To improve the, the pre-oxygenation in this study, our colleague from the group of uh, Karim Asinoun and Michael Vurs from Nantes tried to evaluate the pre-oxygenation with uh, high flow in comparison to standard face mask pre-oxygenation. In this randomized controlled trial, unfortunately, high flow oxygen therapy has the same results about, about uh, than um, facial mask the primary outcome was the lowest SpO2 during uh, intubation, no significant difference. Then the others, uh, other, other start HFO in selected patients with morbid obesity and find that probably in obese patient, you can win some apnea duration than in non-obese patient. So after with uh, the group also with Karim Asinoun, with collaboration with myself, we decided to, to make this uh, study 
with uh, comparing high flow oxygen therapy to non-invasive ventilation as non-invasive ventilation showed benefit in pre-oxygenation due to the recruitment related to pressure. So, and in this study, we used, we used as uh, the primary outcome, the end oxygen at the end uh, of expiration, which uh, the lower value. And we showed that using NIV, you obtain better results, as you see here in the red points, in comparison to the high flow oxygen therapy uh, in 50 patients in each group. And uh, we observed a lower antidal oxygen and more hypoxemia in the group of high flow oxygen therapy in comparison to non-invasive ventilation. This may easily explain in obese patients, as you know, the weight of the lung and the weight of the heart are compress the lungs and then favorite the uh, atelectasis. So using NIV, you insufflate pressure and using positive and expiratory pressure by PEEP, you can maintain the lung open. In fact, is absolutely uh, applied what said Lachman in uh, 91 that open the lung and always keep it open. So if we summarize the pre-oxygenation technique, you have these uh, stars that you have one is the standard face-based mask. You have the high flow oxygen therapy now called TRIV or apneic oxygenation. You have the non-invasive ventilation and uh, our new paradigm, our new concept is maybe not to compare one to other one, but we can maybe associate both. This is called uh, the uh, association of uh, one is OptiMask and the other, which is uh, the association of uh, uh, facial, of uh, non-invasive ventilation with high flow oxygen therapy. And then we performed a study, which is a multicenter trial with China and with the group of Boston of Danny Telmore to uh, validate the proof of concept. We compared the face mask combined with high flow oxygen therapy, as you see at the left of the slide, with the face mask alone. And we use the same uh, criteria, judgment, that is the lowest untidal oxygenation with the two minutes following intubation. So why we use this strategy of combining both? Because when you use pre-oxygenation with face mask before the laryngoscopy, you have the classical increase of oxygen storage, oxygen reserve in the lung. And when you have the apneic oxygenation, that means you have during laryngoscopy because you remove the facial mask and you have a continuous flow of oxygen therapy during the laryngoscopy, which can limit the uh, hypoxia. As you can see here, you have this uh, situation with the video laryngoscope. <clears throat> and the results are very uh, impressed because we included 400 patients, more than 400 patients, and we see in all patients, non-selected, we have a significant uh, uh, less uh, hypoxemia in the uh, group of the combined versus in the first mask alone. And when we, uh, when we uh, focus on the selected patient with obesity, close to 15 in each group, you have a higher significant difference between both, around 5% difference. This means that in probably which be useful more in obese patient. And we have also the same uh, less hypoxemia defined by oxygen saturation less than 95%. Another technique is to combine non-invasive ventilation to high flow oxygen therapy. And then we validated this strategy, not in uh, OR. Now, up to then, no study was performed in OR, but we validated this study in ICU patient and then hypoxemic ICU patient. As you can see here, we started the pre-oxygenation with uh, NIV and you have, you have under the facial mask, you have the nasal cannula. You have sometimes a leak, but no problem to the leaks. And you have here, when you remove the tube, the, the facial mask, you have always the oxygen delivery by the high flow oxygen therapy. And this showed um, a, a very good results. This is the first strategy, what was an NIV compared to spontaneous breathing. And we showed in uh, more than uh, close to 20 years, it was my first study uh, published on the mice trial. We showed that for the first time the NIV 
when we developed for first this technique, it was better than the spontaneous breathing alone. And this, the same study, the same study that we performed in two, uh, six was reproduced uh, uh, two months ago in June and was published uh, in the New England Journal by the group of uh, Semler from Michigan, as you know, and they used 600, 640 uh, patients in each group. They perform exactly the same study and find the same uh, results that uh, you have less hypoxemia with non-invasive ventilation, 9% versus 8%. This is really uh, wonderful to have a study published uh, in New England that we performed very similar uh, 20 years ago. This is a trial that we performed with NIV and high flow. It's and shows that uh, the combination of both NIV and high flow obtain less oxygen. This could be probably inserted in a uh, in uh, OR in the future, because now last generation of uh, anesthesia workstation could deliver both oxygen therapy and NIV. What about airway management? In fact, uh, this is classical malampathy that we use. We have several, several scores in anesthesia care, but no score uh, is available today in ICU. So we developed the first score uh, for difficult intubation called Makocha score in ICU patients. And you see here the Makocha scores, you have some points related to the patient, some points related to the pathology, and some related to the operator. And the score is from zero to 12. As you see, the malampathy is the maximum score of your five. And what is interesting, if you have a score less than three, you have very low risk for difficult intubation. Between four to seven, you have an intermediate. And if you have a score above eight, you are probably a high risk to difficult intubation in your ICU patient. Now we should change our practice in ICU and to make, make exactly the same thing than in OR. That means to detect uh, because to detect before intubation the difficult intubation. Then how we can do? Probably the video laryngoscope is now time to use it for all the patient. We recently published a paper showing that it could be used as the first line therapy instead of the Macintosh laryngostop. And then in this trial, which is a sub-analysis of intube study in JAMA, we showed that only 17% used in the world, in the 29 countries, the video laryngoscope in ICU, as you see a difference between North America close to 50% and to Australia. And as you see, 0% in Africa. So probably we should use it uh, better in the future because we have good results. And this paper uh, was published because it's again an American group, the same group that previously from Semler and Kaze from Michigan. Each year they published a paper in a, in a, in a New England journal, the same that we performed a few years before. This, they, they compared video laryngoscope to Macintosh and showed that the uh, first line uh, success was higher with the video laryngoscope in comparison to the direct laryngoscope with Macintosh. And then to obtain a, a good expertise, you need to have more than 76 attempts with the GlideScope and around above 15 with uh, this the, Mac in, the, um, uh, the, the combine of both uh, the coming from uh, the Macintosh. And in fact, this slide summarizes the work that we performed during the last 20 years on how we can improve intubation in ICU. And you see, when you start, we have only 10 points. Now we have 15 and half of this coming from uh, the uh, operating room. As you see here, for example, pre-oxygenation, upright positioning. This is coming from ICU. You have the video laryngoscope coming from uh, uh, OR. You have the Stile and Bougie from OR. You have the rapid sequence induction from OR, Celic maneuver, and you have the capnography coming from OR. So you have the same, and then you can also uh, transfer to the other side, like recruitment maneuver and other. The protective ventilation is totally uh, a way that used in ARDS patient and uh, we transfer this with our French group, with Emmanuel Fittier and our French group, to the healthy lung patient 
in a patient who received abdominal surgery. And we published this paper in a New England Journal showing that applied lung protective mechanical ventilation, which associated low tidal volume between six to eight mil per kilogram predicted body weight, a PIP value between six to eight, remember seven and seven, with recruitment maneuver. This is a bundle. And if you want to have a positive result, you should apply the free strategy together. So recently you have the driving pressure developed in ICU, and this was transferred to the OR with this Spanish study showing that uh, using the uh, driving pressure, you could have less complications. And another one is the mechanical power, mechanical power developed in uh, the ICU. Mechanical power is uh, an entity which uh, summarizes all the parameters, the respiratory parameters, which leads to uh, VLE, ventilator and this lung injury. You have the respiratory rate, the tidal volume, driving pressure. And this, when you have all of this, you have something called mechanical power. And now there is study in uh, OR. You, we perform now improve one, improve two, and this we have improve three with mechanical power. And studies showing that more you have mechanical power or you have more you have plateau pressure on the driving pressure, more you have acute respiratory failure. So you have more recent paper on uh, less atelectasis when you use pressure support ventilation in comparison to control volume. This was uh, evaluated by uh, ultrason. And uh, we showed recently in this uh, study uh, the effect of non-invasive ventilation after extubation in a patient with obesity. And we showed non-invasive ventilation in comparison to oxygen therapy. It's better to use non-invasive ventilation. You have less than half uh, complication after. So uh, I finish by this study, uh, non-invasive ventilation after uh, surgery. NIV could uh, decrease the reintubation only in a patient with acute respiratory failure after abdominal surgery. We don't have study comparing high flow oxygen therapy for the moment. And this is to perform a good NIV. Please, when you applied non-invasive ventilation, first of all, or high flow, if you have an improvement of the status of the patient, clinical gas exchange and clinical improvement, you can follow. If you have no clinical gas exchange and the clinical status improvement after 15, 15 to 30 minutes, you should probably intubate the patients. So this is a high flow oxygen therapy. I will show you for the first time the first uh, slides of the CT scan and the conclusion of the study, which is ongoing, is ONIVA study. You have some responder patient in CT scan. This is a responder patient with high flow. You have less atelectasis with uh, high flow, and you have some patient non responder. For example, this patient is non responder. You have exactly the same before and after. In fact, when you use high flow oxygen therapy, you have responder, non responder. Eddie will speak about this. And you have in NIV the same thing, responder and non-responder. <laughs> and we have now a new concept that probably increase the area of the upper airway. <laughs> this is of my final slide. We now reproduce all the study by the big East study, <coughs> which is a study which compared standard oxygen, high flow, and non-invasive ventilation in medical and surgical patients. And uh, now we included uh, one third of the patient. We included 700 uh, patients, and we have uh, to reach 2,000. We have the first interim analysis. In terms of local regional anesthesia, we have some observational study. There is only one randomized study by the group of Clermont-Ferrand of Mathieu Jabodon, and this study was performed with thoracic epidural, and unfortunately, in acute pancreatitis patient, it was negative. And now about allogenic gas, you have a lot of feasibility study of safety. As you see here, we performed a lot of study also. And at this moment, you have four big randomized trials in progress. Two of the four studies are finished. 
the last patient was included. And now these uh, two studies are in uh, analysis and soon submit and two other are used. You have different criteria, some in IRDS patients, some for delirium, etc. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Jabert, for the wonderful presentation. I uh, think we'll have a lot of uh, questions at the end. And now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Professor Elia Zule, please. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm delighted uh, to attend this webinar, not only because uh, I really believe that uh, next year it will be a unique opportunity for the World Congress of Anesthesiology. You have selected Professor Philippe Escu and Professor Jaber, who are the best possible chairs. And it will happen in Morocco, which is, as you know, a dynamic, uh, evolutive, innovative uh, country that really allows to hope uh, for the best uh, of science, uh, intensive care and anesthesiology. The main events uh, in critical care from my side, uh, so before next year in 26, um, so these are my disclosure, will be about uh, a concept of redefining critical care. And this paper has allowed to look at uh, a global picture of what should be critical care in the years to come and uh, for a specialty that has been developed with the polio epidemics uh, more than 80 years ago, we are now towards a better understanding on how we can personalize the treatments that we deliver to our patients. And this is true for anesthesia as it is true for intensive care and the rest of medicine. I would like to address uh, two specific points, uh, one about longer term outcomes, the personalized approach uh, in the setting of large scale studies. As you know, one of the reasons why ICU patients have prolonged ICU stay is the way we manage sedation, we handle delirium, and we are taking our patients to winning situations that are making uh, their ICU stay a very specific experience. How do we treat delirium? And there are many different studies that are not providing the same results, but are delivering important messages on what we can expect them from uh, delirium management. I'm not providing the wonderful Brazilian randomized controlled trial that assess the presence of family members in the ICU 24 seven to see whether delirium was reduced. And delirium was not reduced, but there were a number of important outcomes that were very positive, making that we have opened our ICU beds 24 seven. Here, it's not about a therapeutic approach for delirium. In the Mind USA uh, group uh, with these investigators led by uh, Wes Eli, you can see that this treatment approach has been evaluated in a randomized controlled trial comparing haloperidol to ziprazidon. Interestingly, in this double-blind placebo RCT of patients having either acute respiratory failure or shock, and of course delirium, they compared the two drugs with a primary endpoint that is, uh, I would say, a la mode, based on a, a number of days alive without delirium or coma during the first two ICU weeks. This shows very clearly that uh, we are in a new approach with a pharmacologic effect of uh, 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 the, these drugs uh, to reduce the ICU stay and improve the ICU experience. Interestingly, the number of days between the placebo and the, the haloperidol or the ziprazidone groups were not significantly different. That shows that uh, no treatment, haloperidol or ziprazidone are leading to the same number of days alive with delirium or coma. What is interesting in how the ICU advances with these big trials is that you can then 
publish uh, follow-up studies to see what are the longer term outcomes of these ICU intervention. So as expected, these investigators in a pre-specified uh, follow-up uh, had uh, an assessment of cognitive, functional, psychological, quality of life and employment outcomes uh, in uh, these patients uh, after three and six months. You can see here that uh, neither haloperidol nor ziprazidol, when used to treat delirium, affected actually cognitive function, disability, mental health, and quality of life. So no effect on short term and no effect on longer term. Again, we are into the approach that a multimodal evaluation of our interventions is useful, short term and long term high quality research, high impact interventions, and more to think about it. Let's change the continent to now move to the United to the to Europe. Uh, and we are here in Denmark. Uh, and you can see that the use of haloperidol in this trial has also been assessed in a very uh, positive way. Multicenter blinded placebo control trial to receive either IV haloperidol or placebo. So we don't have the ziprasidol here. And as much as the delirium was continuous in the ICU, patients received haloperidol. Interestingly, the number of days alive out of the hospital after randomization was the primary endpoint. Again, this primary endpoint was not met. And you can see here, that this new outcome measure of interest uh, that we either call the DAWLs or the day alive uh, out of hospital at day 90, which are not the DAWL because there is no organ dysfunction, but when you're at home, so then it says everything, there was no difference uh, making that haloperidol based on the primary outcome would not be considered to be a therapeutic option. However, and the secondary outcome were also negative. However, there was a very unexpected result in this trial about day 90 mortality that was 7% lower in the haloperidol group than in the placebo group. And you can see here the subgroup analysis. That says that again, looking at the same data in the same patients or maybe a little bit different patients, you can not only move your, um, your uh, interventions to be assessed in a multimodal way on a short and longer term outcome, and sometimes assess and get to unexpected results. Um, I want to emphasize these different trials with the follow-up because the follow-up is also now uh, assessed in the Danish trial. Because of these results, uh, we are now in uh, the capability of delivering a high level of evidence management uh, of uh, delirium in the critically ill. And this is very important to guide the clinical practice at the bedside. As said by Professor Jaber, we need to gather research, uh, moving our checkerboard between ICU, OR, and other critical care setting and primary care setting to just move the concept and uh, be able to deliver elements, components of care that can guide patient management uh, for the best, as you can see here. I'm now moving to another uh, um, uh, domain that is about oxygenation target. This is a hot topic in critical care. And I start this uh, uh, presentation, this second part of presentation by a systematic review meta-analysis. Uh, I have selected one that is published in Anesthesia and Algesia, reporting 12 studies, more than 7,000 patients. Uh, and you can see that uh, when compared two different um, oxygenation targets. Uh, and this is very variable from one study to the other. You can compare from overall 21, 25 to above 26. Uh, the two uh, oxygenation targets in this systematic review and meta-analysis did not lead to different outcome. This is the forest plot for mortality. 
And you can see that in all the studies, uh, even if there are stri striking differences, there are no uh, overall, there is no overall impact of the oxygenation target on patient survival. What does it say? It says that despite uh, the feeling from experimental translational research uh, that there might be a toxicity of oxygen on critically ill patients, uh, the, the evidence is very difficult to assess using the classic, I would say, clinical trials. So what are we left with? Should we consider that there is no impact of oxygenation target, which would be, you know, very discouraging for all the people making research on that? Or should we assess Mary maybe with a different approach, with a different concept, as said by Professor Jaber, the same data with another eye? Let's go that way. So this was the impact of uh, uh, mechanical ventilation three days in the systematic review meta-analysis. So let me try by providing the data from the hot COVID uh, uh, trial. So this is, again, uh, a study from the Danish group, the hot COVID trial group. Uh, uh, and of course, I admire them so much that I'm referring them twice in the same presentation. But they are comparing lower versus higher targets uh, and dowels the day alive without life support uh, in COVID-19. So you can see that they are trying to assess uh, the impact uh, of hypohyperoxia, and they are making a clinical trial randomizing 726 patients uh, and comparing two very different uh, targets uh, with a PAO2 about uh, in about 60 as compared to PA2 in about 90. You can see here that uh, the randomization went very well and that uh, most of the patients were available for the primary analysis. Uh, among the patients, uh, the number of dowels that they alive without life support was 80 days in the lower oxygenation group um, and 72 days in the higher one, showing that there were more days alive without life support in the lower oxygenation group, um, inviting all of us uh, to be very, very careful with the way we deliver oxygen and uh, inciting us to go to the lower oxygenation target. Um, mortality was not significantly different. There is a 4.5% difference, uh, percent difference uh, in mortality it was not significantly different, and that puts forward the, the interest of assessing our clinical trials with new outcome variables like the DAWL, the number of days alive without life support. Interestingly, the study was done very well. Look at the, different, uh, 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 the difference in, term, in terms of PaO2, SpO2, and FiO2, and very clearly we can see that there is no overlap or very little overlap. The patients went uh, to uh, throughout all the ICU stay in the two different groups, making very big differences. And you can see here that uh, the lower oxygenation target had a better number of days alive without life support. Again, looking at the dowels, you need to see that we are in a multi-state model. Patients are either died or are alive and receiving life support or alive without receiving life support. And indeed, you can see that there is a significant difference within the, the number of days alive without life support. And these are the subgroup analyses, of course, according to whether the patients had COPD. Now, and I would like to open a new door in our current discussions about how we deliver results of clinical trials. Of course, we have learned with RDS that not all patients with RDS should have the same oxygenation and ventilation strategies. When you look at the data from Professor Jaber, including on intubation or including on oxygen management, you can see that according to who is the patient, you would be very uh, uh, keen to deliver a different model of care. It can be a stratification based on, on the risk like the malampathy or like other 
uh, 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 high risk uh, scores. Uh, but here we are assessing the same data using machine learning. And the machine learning approaches are only assessing whether the treatments should all be the same for every ICU patients. Of course, you know the answer, and the answer is no. One size cannot fit all. But still, let's look at the data. So this is Kevin Brew from the group of Chicago and the group of uh, Matthew Semler, and uh, they have actually used two sets of data, one for deriving the, 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 their algorithm and the other one to validate the algorithm. So they made the derivation on the pilot trial, I will detail that, and then they made a validation on the ICU rocks trial. As you can see here, the two trials are very different. Uh, one is a, a, a cluster randomized trial, the other one is two parallel groups. Uh, one assessed uh, a lower SpO2 at 90, the other one at 91, 96. Uh, you can see that the, the Australian trial, the ICU rocks included 21 centers. The US trial included only one center, but much more patients, 2,500 as compared to 965. And uh, all those patients had uh, a primary outcome for these trials, the number of VFDs, the number of ventilation free days at day 28. Interestingly, when we look at the different trials, pilot and ICU rocks, um, you can see that uh, the patients were ventilated into the two groups, lower versus higher oxygenation target. Uh, and uh, instead of keeping the patients in a very rigid and uh, I would say diminishing model, we are more now into thinking on the different targets uh, that could happen. So let's take the SpO2 as an independent variable and classify the patients according to whether they are in, the, in the, the, the third tiles, upper third, middle third, and in blue, the lower third. Of course, we are interested on the outcomes in the lower third. And you can see on the right part of this slide that the lower third, of course, was a third. It's a third tile, but it's interesting to consider that patients can have a different, uh, you, you are not anymore into a randomization scheme. You are more on how was delivered the care and how it translates into outcomes. So there is a logistic regression analysis in the ICU rocks, uh, and then uh, the lower third of uh, predicted individualized treatment uh, had a 28-day mortality, 6% lower than the others. Interestingly, when we look at the data, look at the left part of this slide, and you can see that whatever is the randomization arm, some patients might benefit from a higher SpO2 target, the red ones, and in blue, some patients might benefit from the lower oxygenation target. So the question is not anymore, should we give 91 or 98? The patient is, the clinical question is, who are the patients who should benefit from the lower and who are the patients who should benefit from the higher SpO2 target? And this is now, we are crossing the borders for the use of new tools and new AI models that are taking us from the classic randomized trial to the reality of what is the bedside, trying to bring answers that will be certainly more meaningful for the future. And of course, the conclusion is everyone can benefit from either lower or higher SpO2 according on patient characteristics. Again, the management, and I'm following on the very important message reported by Professor Jaber, our chairman for next year, as well as uh, our chair today, that the management of oxygenation and ventilation in the critically ill, either in the OR or on the ICU, will undergo a very, very significant change in the years to come because we are understanding better 
and we are engaging ourselves into new model conceptualizing the 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 the, the level of evidence for ICU patients. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be in this webinar, and I look forward to any question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Azoulay, for the wonderful presentation and very stimulative. Uh, I We have some questions. First of all, I uh, would like to say that I like your uh, both uh, messages that we need this uh, flow of uh, knowledge from OR to intensive care units and uh, from intensive care unit to uh, to OR. So uh, it's... Uh, it's time for a closer collaboration between uh, between uh, all specialties to improve the patient care. Um, we have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, one, the first one uh, was related to the uh, video laryngoscope. So my understanding is that uh, now uh, the proposal is to, to use for all patients, for all intubations, the video laryngoscope from the studies you presented. But there is a question, how many Africans were in the study uh, on video laryngoscope? Um, I don't understand clearly the question if it's for OR or for ICU. Uh, it was a first question. Now, is that doesn't mention it? Uh, Ask only uh, if in that uh, study on uh, video laryngoscopy there were also patients from uh, uh, African uh, countries. There are in the paper in the paper of uh, um, called entry paper. The sub analysis showed zero zero percent in Africa. Zero percent. No 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 video laryngoscope in Africa in ICU. There is. There are in OR, some some in OR, but no uh, reported in ICU in Africa. Africa uh, for today should absolutely, we should help our colleagues from Africa to have uh, the video laryngoscope uh, for at least for the most uh, difficult intubation in my point of view. And you see, you have only less than 20% in Europe. The majority is in uh, uh, U.S. and in uh, New Zealand and Australia. Thank you. So I, I think the, the messages or the, the the pathway is not to have different standards in different places in the, the world. We have to, to <clears throat> fight and advocate for having uh, access to to these devices everywhere. So we have to, to work together with uh, our partners in industry and to, to uh, go for uh, lower prices because uh, uh, now video laryngoscopes are not so uh, expensive, <laughs> at least in Europe. So I think the future is to have the availability of these uh, devices also in, uh, in uh, less uh, resourced uh, uh, settings. I absolutely agree with you, absolutely agree. We performed a study in our hospital, in our hospital, a paper recently published in the BGA, and we now, our practice in OR, in operating room, our practice is to use video laryngoscope for all the patients, selected or non-selected. And we make a pharmacoeconomic study, and we showed there's no difference in the price of both. Because when you are when you use video laryngoscope, you use less bla um, blade uh, for difficult intubation, etc. Less delay, less etc. And then you have exactly for we we, we evaluated three thousand patients, and the budget is very close. Now, if we discuss very well with the company, we can have some price for the blade of video laryngoscope very cheaper. Now, I think we you are right for this. There is a question about uh, hypoxia. Uh, there is a comment or a question. If uh, saying hypoxia not only kills, but produce uh, organ damage done, and the same uh, person is asking, what about hypoxia, low hemoglobin, low perfusion, together in uh, the role in organ damage and mortality or delirium? Elia, well, I think that uh, uh, when it comes to evaluate the impact of hypoxemia in uh, organ damage, uh, 
I wouldn't say that this is, well, at least in the patients with RDS, uh, there are very conflicting data on the impact of PF ratio on outcomes. As you know, this was the base of the burden definition, making three strata with uh, uh, three groups of patients based on PF ratio. However, the discussion here is more about uh, organ dysfunction based on the use of life-sustaining therapies. We need to think back to how we use an ICU bed. Using an ICU bed, the least number of days to be able to admit to the ICU more patients. So this is why the DAWL and the, these new outcome variables not only indicate that the patient survived, but they also use very much less ICU resources. And this has a lot of sense, not only in uh, developing countries, but also in industrialized countries where the number of beds is not uh, assessed in a way that every, every patient needing an ICU bed can use it. Thank you, but um, this is because also my interest is uh, related to hemostasis and transfusion. What about hypoxia and low hemoglobin? Well, this is uh, something that uh, this is something that has been very much assessed. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, for oxygen transport, uh, one of the classic recommendation in patients with low hemoglobin, the time we are uh, 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 providing a, a transfusion product uh, is to maintain a certain SpO2. But the level of evidence is not so high. And when you, you look at the determinant of cardiac output, you would be surprised to see that SpO2 is only one of the components. Uh, one thing is sure, you don't have to get to 99% of SpO2. And uh, when we look at the individualized targets, um, it has not been assessed yet. But we could, for example, look whether the patients with active bleeding might be the one in the red group, uh, where uh, the other one might be the one in the blue group. But this is not something for which we have the answer today. But we know that the door is open for further assessment. To, to complete this, uh, the message of Ellie, we have, I think you know this, some studies about uh, liberal versus not liberal transfusion in uh, cardiac surgery, in traumatic, sur in traumatic patient. This week you have in the New England, a paper showing that there is a difference between liberal versus not liberal. And then in traumatic patient, it's better to have nine uh, hemoglobin versus seven, but in some patients like a cirrhotic, you have no difference. In fact, it depends of the patient about the, the value of the hemoglobin. It depends of the type of the patient. First, suddenly it has, it was shown in several studies that one important point is the edge of the hemoglobin. When you transfused very old, uh, uh, red red cells, you have a, a worse outcome than if you tra you you uh, transfuse the young, or your laboratory give you the old because the old should be used. And then this is a difference. And the last point, it has been shown by two study, if you transfuse the the red cells, man to man, woman to woman it's better than you transfuse men to women. This is just statistical analysis. We don't have clear explanation, but uh, you have this study available. Thank you. There are um, more questions about oxygen. So in the OR, should all patients without comorbidities under regional anesthesia <coughs> be given oxygen or it should be in demand? My practice, my practice, is to use oxygen because the patient at any time, in my point of view, local regional anesthesia, you should always imagine that at any time you should transform your local regional anesthesia in general anesthesia. So in my point of view, we should use at least a low flow of oxygen therapy. Then you can increase if you use to complete your local regional anesthesia by sedation, you can have the oxygen therapy, but in my point, we should use it. I know that it costs some, in some country is oxygen with cost. To my knowledge, to my knowledge, 
I don't know, but I don't know very well, but maybe the literature. I don't know if there is a studies comparing local regional anesthesia with oxygen therapy given without oxygen therapy in all patients. I don't know. Maybe some somebody knows in the chat, but in my opinion, there is no study. But in my practice, we use very low flow oxygen. Thank you. Know what is your practice? What is your practice, uh, Daniela? For uh, regional anesthesia? Yes. Not in all patients. Not in all patients, no. No. But in, I, I agree for young people or something like this, not necessary, but for an older patient of 70 years, uh, et cetera, do you use it? No. You, you uh, monitor? Yes, it, it, it depends on, on, the, on, the, on the patient. It's, it's true. But uh, uh, to give uh, an example of my practice, because I'm in cardiac uh, uh, surgery, when I am doing the, the rounds uh, for the patients extubated, for example, I'll, I always look to the level <coughs> of oxygen, how much <coughs> it's given on the, on the mask. And sometimes <coughs> I'm saying they do not need after the operation because as in regional anesthesia and OR, so also in intensive care in the, in the post-operative period, there is a tradition, you know, to give uh, uh, oxygen by mask after operation, and I disagree. So there is another uh, question uh, about uh, about uh, fi um, uh, fiber optic laryngoscopy. If uh, this awake fiber optic laryngoscopy <coughs> came down <coughs> with the availability of video laryngoscope. Uh, using it awake? Yes. No, I, I, no, I don't, don't think. No, it's not possible to have video laryngoscope awake. I understand that you have a fibroscopy, fibroscopy awake for difficult intubation. Yes. This, in our strategy, is the last point. The plan A, B, C, D is to use fibroscopy, but fibroscopy should be used by a good, skilled doctor, because now the young resident use very low the fibroscopy, like us, and uh, the, the, the video laryngoscope you cannot use in a patient awake. You should absolutely have a patient with uh, at least sedation. Can you use uh, non-invasive ventilation in operation room uh, whenever we face, when we have a critical patient for surgery? It depends on the type of surgery. It depends. Uh, we use it when you have a uh, lower surgery, not abdominal surgery, but uh, for the uh, for, for, for the foot or something like this in the lower extremity uh, for the knee or something like this, we use it. We published a paper using uh, pressure support ventilation with a group of non-invasive ventilation. But I think that now we can use probably high flow oxygen therapy for oxygenation. But uh, if you use non-invasive ventilation, you should absolutely know very well how to use it with the work anesthesia station. And this could be good for the patient with obesity who have uh, apneic syndrome with uh, a machine at home. Thank you. There is another question about uh, the um, uh, parameters for deciding oxygen targets. So for now, the only thing that we could say is that we there are little evidence uh, that uh, there is a, a benefit from higher oxygen target. Uh, so basically, as a primary approach, uh, I would keep oxygenation target between 92 and 94. However, the AI data seems to suggest that some patients might benefit from higher and some from lower, but we don't know who are specifically those patients. We spoke about bleeding. We spoke maybe about septic shock, et cetera. But the, the studies are now ongoing to see how, uh, how the cluster of patients benefiting from higher targets, uh, who they are and what are their characteristics. Uh, I would not give any recommendation, but that uh, for now, 20 to 24 is either the best or even than higher. So there is no reason now to go higher. And for all our colleagues that are connected, when we do an IC round, we should keep the oxygenation target uh, between below 95 and of course above 92 when it's possible. 
Thank you. Uh, and the same uh, person has a second question. Uh, what are the measures put in place for training personnel in airway management, keeping in mind that availability of equipment does not directly translate to improved outcomes? Absolutely agree. Now, the uh, simulation is uh, a mandatory in France. I don't know if uh, in other countries mandatory or no for the resident. Now, all of the residents that we have, have a mandatory um, seminary to have two or three days to have uh, airway management uh, um, with uh, expert and uh, in the simulator. Uh, and this is absolutely necessary today. And no study was proved that we improve the outcome. Uh, at this moment, but all the studies that compared, not randomized, but compared uh, the group of uh, residents who received very early the simulation courses versus no, we have more uh, first intubation than first intubation success than in comparison to other. So my message is it should be mandatory to have regularly uh, session of uh, simulator of airway management for all residents, uh, not only for ICU or, uh, or for all anesthesia, ICU and also emergency department. Thank you, I agree. There is a question about the role of magnesium in reducing delirium in ICU patients. What do you think about magnesium? Well, that, that is a very uh, a striking question because there are trials that have been uh, uh, testing the use of magnesium in different conditions. We know, for example, that uh, magnesium can be a cardiac stabilizer. We also know that it is used to, to uh, uh, in uh, uh, eclampsia. We know that it can be used to stabilize endothelial dysfunction in many different diseases. We did a randomized control trial with my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Zafrani, and she was unable to demonstrate a benefit from magnesium in thrombotic microangiopathies. But for now, the reality is that uh, we, the, uh, giving magnesium to patients uh, in the ICU is mostly contained by when uh, we are uh, with uh, endothelial dysfunction, eclampsia, and sometimes when we want to reduce uh, the urine excretion of potassium. But there is no recommendation beyond the basic needs of magnesium outside these clinical indications. Thank you. There is uh, There are a lot of uh, comments and uh, questions about the video laryngoscopy. So many are saying that they don't have uh, them in, in uh, sub Saharan uh, Africa. But there is uh, one, I think, question if there are the same results for pediatric uh, patients with uh, video laryngoscopy as in the adults. Yes, I, I don't have experience of uh, pediatry, but when we discuss with my colleagues of pediatry, they use also the same the video laryngoscope now more and more in the pediatry. They have exactly the same results and an uh, adult. Now you have dedicated uh, uh, video laryngoscope with blades specific for uh, uh, pediatric patients. There is I don't know if you have experience of pediatric, uh, no. Daniela. No, in, in, like in, no, many years ago. Now uh, in our uh, like center, we have only adult uh, uh, cardiac patients. But uh, many years ago, yes, we had also. And when I was in France, I was in a Bichat Hospital uh, uh, having also pediatric cases. Yeah. Uh, but many years ago. Uh, so... Um, there is a question about how much oxygen uh, in ICU, um, how much uh, the percentage of oxygen in ICU, how, how, what should be the percentage of ICU in ICU? I don't... Uh, it's the same question that before, no? The target of uh, oxygen saturation yes, is the same. Yes, probably, yes. Any response to this before? Yes. Yeah, we, we addressed this okay. already, yeah. Yes. And uh, there are some requests for sharing some studies, but uh, I will write. Uh, uh, I will uh, repeat that uh, this webinar will be uh, 
available on demand uh, starting on Friday, so you can uh, have all the the articles and review all uh, all the articles uh, uh, from That's the slides. Nice. Yes. And um, I, I have a question uh, for the obesity. The first uh, studies you presented, Professor Jaber. So why are the uh, complications higher in uh, obese patients in ICU compared to, to OR? Ah, this is a very good question. In fact, uh, in ICU, all the patients, the real patient ICU, have comorbidity and have organ failure, organ dysfunction. This is the first thing is related to patient. Secondly, the uh, area is not the same. When you are in uh, OR, you have, in France, nurse anesthetic, you have the resident, you have a senior, and it's quite is uh, often planned surgery. So you have time to make a good uh, intubation. And uh, more often in, uh, in ICU, you have a patient the, the first indication is acute respiratory failure and the acute respiratory failure in patients with obesity, you have less, as you know very well, you have less oxygen storage, so you have less time to uh, make uh, a good intubation in case of difficult intubation. You have less, less than one minute to decrease less than 85% in comparison to a normal subject if you have five to six minutes because you have the line closed rapidly. It's, it's impressive. We have now studies showing what happened just after, just after one minute, just after one minute, when you make the intubation of an obese patient, you have close to one third of the lung closed. This is why it's very important to make a pre-oxygenation with positive pressure. Yes, yeah, so if I uh, summarize, your uh, uh, suggestion is to have a uh, laryngoscope and uh, non-invasive ventilation for uh, oxygen all patients. Yes, for oxygenation and also okay. checklist. So, absolutely, well, absolutely. Because, because we have so many uh, comments or, or, or questions about the laryngoscopy in Africa. So there is <coughs> one question about uh, um, if you... Uh, uh, if the study on laryngoscopy will, is there any uh, uh, suggestion to replicate the study in Africa? So it's in fact a suggestion for a study. What do you think about this? I, I agree with you. We should do it in Africa. We should do it. We should. We should help our colleagues. And I think is also, as said by Professor Azoulay, is our, our role to help our colleagues and to help them for not only improve uh, the care, but improve also the research, clinical research. And uh, with the uh, companies, we should help them. And also uh, the, the job made by the WFSA, it's impressive uh, when we see what happened from 10 years, 20 years. Now uh, all our colleagues improve with your help. Thank you. Yes, I think this is a very important message that we have to expand the research to to other sites, not uh, only, uh, you know, well-known uh, sites. I think this is very helpful uh, also for the <clears throat> research, but also <clears throat> for the sites to, for uh, these hospitals to, to improve. I remember when I was first involved in... Uh, in the protein study many, many years, many years uh, ago, uh, this re research changed my life and my career. So it, it is so important to be part of research and to follow all the, you know, the uh, um, uh, rules uh, you have to apply when you participate to a study, uh, how to fill in all the forms and everything. So it changed your way of uh, treating the patient. You are more careful. That's why probably uh, sometimes the studies are not uh, applicable in, in practice because when you perform study, you are very careful <laughs> with uh, your patients. As said, uh, so. as said often by Professor Azoulay, don't forget that the research clinical, the only objective is to improve the outcome of patient. Maybe, Eddie, you can complete. No, I, I, I fully it's... agree. I just want to mention that as teaching societies, we are committed to guide the practice at the bedside. I think that uh, everything that has been said today and the discussion that we have, Daniela and Samir, today are very important to reshape uh, a new model of care that is based on evidence. 
that will improve survival in our patients. And I'm very happy that you are going to Morocco uh, in, uh, in 2026 for different reasons. And one of them is that we did the Euromed with the European Society. And uh, when we look at the Moroccan Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care, they are wonderful. They are just uh, looking at how they can improve the care, how they can collaborate, how they are welcoming uh, the, the colleagues uh, and making the best of care, communicating, talking to each other. And from that, with uh, Professor Jaber, we have developed research and, uh, and many uh, teaching programs with our colleagues from Morocco. And I, I'm sure that uh, we learn from them as much as they learn from us. And this is the, the w, WFSA the, and all the teaching societies that we are, we need to really address this by improving the care at the bedside. Thank you. I think this, this is the best uh, way to finish, uh, to close uh, our webinar with these uh, words for uh, collaboration or for the best uh, care of our patients. Uh, I would like to, to thank uh, uh, the speakers uh, and also all those who contributed uh, and attended to the webinar. Uh, see you uh, in October for the next webinar. Thank you so much for your Bye -bye. presence. Bye.